Hello, welcome. My name is Dr. David Bray. I'm your host as well as director at the Atlantic Council Geotech Center, where we look at how data and technology is changing geopolitics in the world and how geopolitics in the world change how we do data and technology. Today, we're here to talk about actionable steps in turbulent times, rebuilding more resilient local and global communities. We have four very impressive guests uh, who have done very impressive steps not just before COVID-19, but in the midst of COVID-19 as well, they're helping to rebuild communities at the local and the national and the global level. And I'm excited to say that three or four of them, just as a few days ago, are now senior fellows with the Atlantic Council as well. And uh, Bob, maybe we can also get you in the queue as well if you're interested. But with that, I wanna go first to Krista. Krista, could you introduce a little bit about who you are and what you do? And if you could tell us, what do you think needs to be done to help rebuild more resilient local and global communities? Does it? Thanks so much, David. Uh, so yeah, so beyond being a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, um, I am a former uh, senior executive in the Canadian government, within the private sector, and in some of our largest social profit organizations. I now run a consulting agency that is focused on individuals and organizations who are working at the intersection of innovation and social impact. So really looking exactly what the Geotech Center does. How do we use technology to drive positive change in the world? I'm also the co-founder of Singularity U Canada. Over the past eight years, I have been working very closely with Canada's digital ID uh, community to look at how in Canada we might create an inclusive, interoperable framework in Canada and hopefully be able to connect that into the world to look at digital ID. For many people, they haven't thought about digital ID. It's not always the sexiest thing, but all of those sexy things that you want to do with the internet, those are enabled by robust digital identity. And so my call to action on what I think we could do and, and what would really be transformative in a post-COVID environment is to take advantage of this, this opportunity that is before us to reimagine the core infrastructure and systems that we've come to know and say, how might we rebuild something? How might we build back better, more inclusive, privacy enhancing, more secure, more, I guess, more all encompassing and interoperable, not just in a digital world, but also in our real world. And that to me is the big challenge before us. And it's not a technical one. This is a question of policy and governance. We have the technology, now we need the leadership. Very well said, Chris. And if I can ask you a real quick rejoinder on that, because you talked about the importance of digital identity and you said it, it's recognizing it's, it's, it's not just the digital world, it's also reimagining our, our physical world and recognizing there are some injustices that we need to make more just. Uh, we had a conversation last week talking about how in the United States, we still don't have uh, electronic health records that individuals can access readily or even be aware of people accessing. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you see as sort of like, what would be the first two to three use cases for digital identity that would make for more inclusive and, and better communities? Absolutely. So a core one obviously is healthcare and putting the patient at the center of that, not having to go to your doctor and your hospital and any other test providers to get all of that information and being able to actually hold that yourself and have access to it and give access to that to any caregivers that you want to. But ultimately, you have the ability to give it and you have the ability to revoke it. And that control of data and the data ethics that goes in that, we can go much bigger on that. And I know last week I was talking with a health expert in this and talk about data ethics around it. So the question of being able to trace through digital identity research that's being done and ensuring that that research and any private information that's given is being applied in the way in which it was given permission so that we don't wind up frankly with a Henrietta Lacks situation. And I was hoping that that was done in the 1950s but there is a case ongoing right now with an Alzheimer's case in Canada and indigenous populations that has repeated exactly the same challenge. And so we're not beyond that. And those to me are two very concrete things that we could be doing now to transform um, people's real life experience. Excellent. And thank you, Krista, for outlining those, those actionable steps forward. Uh, I would like now to turn to friend and colleague, uh, Derry. Derry, um, I, I, I'll let you introduce yourself, but I'll give a prelude saying you are one of the most impressive individuals when it comes to actionable data and AI efforts. So if you could talk a little bit about that and then outline what you think needs to be done to rebuild uh, more resilient local and global communities. 
Sure. And thank you, David, for that uh, awesome uh, uh, intro there. Um, I always appreciate when you, you put that pedestal there for me to achieve. <laughs> um, so, uh, Derry Gorber Dancing, I, um, I've been in the federal, the United States federal government space for a little over 20 something years now and kind of uh, been involved in just about everything. Um, about three years ago or so, I started up my own company. And the primary focus on that space is in the artificial intelligence space, not because I like the word as a fun buzzword, actually, but uh, thanks to David and several others, they pushed me to start thinking differently about a problem that I was trying to solve. And, and lo and behold, the AI actually became part of that solution. Um, we were able to leverage our technologies to help and understand and fight uh, fraudulent activities that's been going on in the uh, Medicare and Medicaid space to go after providers um, who are committing fraudulent acts. Uh, we were able to leverage some of that newfound knowledge of understanding of how to do that and um, help some uh, the United States entities to be able to find and hopefully go after some bad actors as well. Um, so we have got a bit of knowledge from a massive data. Um, we've dealt with multiple petabytes worth of data and it's a big data problem after a while. Um, in terms of the what we're doing and where I see that um, this can kind of play in here, this is a combination of let's not just make policies to make policies, but let's make policies leveraging and understanding data to make right decisions. We can model them out and we have seen and I have actually working on a project right now for Department of Transportation where we have policies and that, that we're evaluating and we have uh, proposed to them new policies that they should probably look to utilize and kill about 70% of the ones that are not utilized the right way. Um, and, and kill them is not the right word, but right size them and to make them more efficient. And so I, I think when you look at a combination of are there some uh, other factors that can come in from monetary, yes, but I think putting the right constructs in place and enabling, providing that enabling factor um, through the use of data and through the use of that education that comes along with it um, is a big piece that we can leverage here. Well said, Darian. I like how you, you pointed out that unfortunately a lot of policy doesn't come with an expiration date or, or an indication of when it should sunset. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so maybe if, if I could actually do a real quick rejoinder on on, you know, we do have a world that, that still is, is, is not as uh, diverse and not as inclusive and is not as just as it needs to be. So, so what are your thoughts about how do we involve communities so that data and AI efforts are done with them as opposed to being done to them? How can we make it so it's more participatory? So uh, this is where we have to take away the everything can be solved by a computer conversation <laughs> and because it can't. And when you talk about communities that are remote communities that have lack of, there's a digital divide, I think is probably the best word here, um, in that there's a lack of resources and a lack of proper data. There isn't data, there isn't, there's not a lack of data, there's not a lack, there's a lack of proper data that can be leveraged. And I think that is critical. What that requires is a true engagement, uh, not purely from let's see how many computers we can put in that place, but a true engagement from a human perspective. And we can't forget that we are humans and we have to work with people uh, in order to, to truly understand what's happening and continuously have that loop in place. Well said, and yes, especially in an era in which, unfortunately, we still have to do some social distancing amidst the pandemic. If we forget the fact that at the end of the day, it's people, uh, we, we may actually find that we've lost the human side. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, I'd actually like to turn to one of my, my also my favorite humans, uh, Molly. And, and, and Molly, if you could real quick introduce who you are, uh, maybe touch upon the flower that's in front of you as well. And, and then what do you think needs to be done to create more resilient local and global communities as well? Thank you, David, and thanks to all of you who've made this possible and who've joined us. I'm Molly John. Um, I am a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but I also have found it necessary to start a company to do the work, uh, my government work. Um, so I run a small research group uh, called John Research Group, 
and there's a website with lots of information, a lot of our reports. Um, we are really interested in unmodeled peril. We do a lot of work on uh, cascading risk. My own background, though, is entirely different. I'm trained as a molecular biologist, geneticist, and plant breeder. I'm the mother of delicata squash, if any of you know what that is. And I love, and I have garden outside. I, I live 30 miles west of Madison, Wisconsin. This is just coming on, these beautiful um, roses, sort of chewed, maybe kind of perfect. Um, and so we are now um, primarily NASA funded. And, um, and also I've begun a stint with DARPA on logistics. Um, there's a program called Log X and uh, what I think needs to be done, what needs to be done here is we're seeing agency appear at a very local level. Uh, and this is, so I deal with food and food systems and agriculture. I'm a former Dean of Agriculture, former Undersecretary at USDA. And we witnessed actually very foreseeable, but utterly shocking disruptions in the food supply chains um, in this country. Uh, I've been one of very few people interested in this concern. So when that happened, I got emails like, dear Oracle. <laughs> um, so I went to work. Um, I uh, am a tenured full professor and I'm in a public university and this is my job. So I went to work, I called lots of people because I know lots of people try to figure out where milk was being dumped, what, why milk was being dumped and, and other you know, really disturbing waste. And so I pieced together, ground up, and I've done this numerous times in my career, a network. I contacted a colleague who runs a company that, that uh, is deeply embedded in the US food system. He has a free tool on the side called Marketplace. We reskinned it and rebranded it as foodsourceusa.com. This is a completely free platform that allows buyers, that, that allows people with surplus food sitting on their loading dock in a food bank acceptable format to easily connect with recipients who are receiving COVID dollars or special philanthropic money to meet unprecedented need for food assistance. So it's a very, very simple play. But the first transaction had 18 people on the phone. So we think reshaping these supply chains, reconnecting people through technology, this is only possible through technology. Um, we actually are in our county, one county, uh, our one food bank was given $3 million of CARES money. And of course, they were completely overwhelmed. So they did a very important thing and they hired some consultants to help them. And they have been awesome partners. Um, that $3 million is being spent in the county on food produced here, which holds up jobs, supply chains. And we've created a new, uh, a new boutique enterprise in product converters. We've mobilized networks of people who are learning how to convert food safely from 40 pound blocks to food bank acceptable format. And uh, just yesterday, I had a kickoff with some graduate students at, at University of Tennessee at Arizona State and at Wisconsin who are going to take this and run with it. So it's about, it's about local agency um, and common sense. And actually, these are all deeply heartfelt efforts. There's not money being made here. We're doing with what we have. And that's a kind of classic American value, I think. Um, putting pieces together and seeing what we can make happen. Well said, Molly, and uh, and and we'll extend it to our friends in Canada as well with Kristen. Absolutely, <laughs> I have Canadian roots. So who, who, is, who actually uh, created the fun little logo behind both you and her, which I notice has the uh, Canadian friendly spelling of center versus the uh, <laughs> U.S. English spelling of center. We so do well that done. in America when we're trying to be cool. The so little messaging here. <laughs> So, so with that, I'd like to now turn to Bob Greenberg. Uh, Bob, could you real quick uh, introduce yourself? You have a long history of trying to help communities be more resilient and more prepared for disasters. So talk a little bit about that. And then what do you think needs to be done now, uh, given everything we're in as well? Sure. Um, and thanks for inviting me and being part of this panel. And aside from being a fellow in waiting at the uh, <laughs> Council Geotech Center, um, I am the... Uh, Founder and CEO of a company, GNH International Services. We've been 
around for 22 years. And David, as you said, what we do is we provide strategies, programs, and technical support to help empower people to make uh, more informed and timely decisions and take action to help build community resilience. Um, we work across all levels of government to do that. In fact, one of the things we do is connect the dots between different levels of government, plus with the private sector and NGOs. Uh, we, our, our, our foot in the door in this is through the emergency management community. Uh, currently, we're embedded in about five COVID task forces across the country. Um, and we are working with them to leverage the, the systems they have already. We're not selling a product. We're leveraging the, uh, the platforms, the capabilities, the tools they have to meet the current need. And that has been quite a interesting challenge. We've had to reconfigure tools that we've developed over the years um, through um, with the support of Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology and FEMA. And we've had to build inventory systems from scratch because what was what was lacking here, one of the big things lacking, and this should have been no surprise because last year there were two national level exercises, one by HHS called, um, uh, what was it called, Crimson Contagion, and it was a year long exercise, and the other by FEMA called Shake and Fury, in which this inability to uh, be able to get, share uh, critical data in a timely way uh, was, cl uh, was clearly lacking. There, all the lessons learned, all the after actions call for it. And of course, COVID hit and proved out all of those, all those uh, problems. And in fact, th those problems cost lives. Mm -hmm. So the inability to get PPEs, the inability to get respirators, in much the same way Molly was talking about food, same thing happened in this area. The fact that the um, emergency management public health community haven't worked together well, um, and, and frankly, there was a lot of tension there. We've had to bridge all that. And I, I echo a lot what uh, Krista said about, this is not a technology issue. This is a governance and policy issue. And we live and die by our uh, work by focusing on governance and policy and technology and service of that. And so what do I think can be done now? I think that, uh, it, in, in this unfortunate situation, it's created a tremendous opportunity. The problem has been clear as clear as day. There were recently some meetings with um, over half the emergency management directors across the country. They're all talking about the same thing. So let's solve the data, the, the data information sharing and the lack of data interoperability. And while we do it, let's um, create the kind of um, um, platforms and capabilities, and including data sharing agreements and frankly, your data trust that you're trying to establish. I think that's a critical move that needs to be taken. Well said, Bob, and that actually is a great tie-in. I know you, we weren't coordinating this, but that's a great tie-in to, okay, so so what, what can we do to make that happen? Because I think what's fascinating, I didn't actually plan it this way, but each of you have both served in government, but also have your own company. So you have both government and industry experience, which I think gives you great perspective. Okay, and, and we've also pointed out, as Molly said, it is about giving communities agency. The challenge is, of course, if you give each local community agency, you're going to end up with more than 2,000 different data models that aren't interoperable and anything like that. So I guess the, the question I'm going to toss out, and maybe I'll go first to, I'll go first to Derry, and then I'll, I'll go to Krista, then Molly, then Bob. But, but sort of, if, if we want to give everybody agency, but we still want people to coordinate, um, what are thoughts about how do we tackle this interoperability issue that Bob so so excellently highlighted? So so Derry, real quick. Oh, you're muted. Whoops, I must have clicked that button. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so w one of the interesting challenges there is that is the big problem that we all face. How do we continue to ensure that folks can still talk to each other? and still have the autonomy to create what they need for themselves. And I think this is part of that conversation with regard to governance and sharing of information. I think there still needs to be some general thoughts as to what is that basic set of information that needs to be shared outside of your space and ensuring that you can keep the data in whatever format you want inside of your space for your own needs but be willing to and have the audacity to be bold enough to actually do something right and put in some effort to create an interoperable format that works with, with a lot of folks. Because we have seen it in the open source space where folks are creating interoperable data sets. 
So why can't we in the collective governments uh, do the same? You know, if a global set of folks can get together and say, this is how we're going to create a program um, that creates an identity, i.e. blockchain, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if, if you can have uh, a global set of folks to come together and say, this is how we're going to share digital currencies. And yet no one person came together and said how we're going to agree to do that. I think there is a method by which this can take place. It requires a willingness and a, um, a bit of bravery, if you will, to, to go against what may be your internal factors of, well, this is how we want to do it. And we don't want to share information with others to so go beyond that fear. And I think that's the, the challenge we have to face. It's not so much a technology problem. It's a human and culture problem. Well said, and I have several scars from standards committees where we used to point out that standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody wants one, they just don't want to use somebody else's. So uh, yes, uh, that, that is a challenge. But with Krista, Derry sort of set it up for you. He said, tying it to identity. So, so, so how are you tackling it in Canada to try and have interoperable identity uh, given the sheer size of Canada? Absolutely, and that's such a yes and moment for me. Um, so yes, everything Darius said, Darius said, and let's be deliberate about who is invited to the conversation and make sure, like, if we invite the usual suspects and put them around the usual table, we're going to get the usual outputs. So in, in picking up Darius' challenge to be bold and be brave, be bold enough to open it up to people you haven't worked with before. Look at the adjacent people, invite those people who don't even know that they should have a voice at the table. Um, Canada is currently undergoing through our standards council um, a review on data and looking at what should our data frameworks be. And I know that the standards council is actively looking and saying, who doesn't think that they should be part of this conversation and how do we bring them in? How do we actively go and seek out Indigenous Canadians? How do we go and seek out new Canadians? How do we bring them into this conversation so that as we're trying to create these interoperable models, we're ensuring not only that they're interoperable, but they actually reflect all of the conversations that are happening. And I think, David, you really touched on it. It's not, it's not about finding a perfect model. It's about figuring out what are those core things that we want to make sure can fit together? What are the joining pieces in the Lego blocks? I don't care what you build with your Lego blocks, so long as they all work together and getting those principles and values together. And, and that's really core. And that, um, looking specifically at digital ID, that's what we've tried to create with the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework is that interoperability. So all of our, fe our federal government, our provincial governments, and our private sector partners have been able to come together and say, these are our principles, our values, our standards. They may not look the same across everybody, but they will work together. And in so doing, we've been able to create a more inclusive model. Now, it's in version 1.0, and this is an open invitation for people to come try it out, poke at it, and make it better. Um, but I think that's a really great place to start. Agreed. And given that you're at 1.0, and I think the US is at either 0.0, .0 or possibly negative 1, I think we'll take any version 1.0. So I hope, I hope our members of Congress, our members of the executive branch, our local mayors and governors are, are able to learn from what Canada is doing, because we have to get this right. Uh, Molly, uh, your thoughts on this topic, and I know, again, given your passion on food, uh, what can be done to empower uh, both people who either grow food, produce food, um, cultivate food uh, in this area as well to help make things more resilient? Well, we're finding that, that that is a kind of a reflex for people now, um, even in urban environments. Um, this, this, this movement, which has occurred through my career as, among other things, a, a vegetable breeder, um, you know, there's so much more interest. Um, one of the most moving experiences I've had recently was moving uh, one of the most challenged high schools in the Milwaukee public school system to the Vincent High School of Agricultural Science. And, and so what, the, speaking of agency, there's something compelling, especially when people are frightened. So in terms of interoperability, um, I have fought those battles as a dean, as an undersecretary, and I have learned exactly what has been said already. Um, it is not it is not wise to take those head on. There is no point taking them head on. Concede that the coffee maker will stay where it is, right? Whatever, right? Um, and so, what we've done as a response to COVID sidesteps that issue. 
it really entirely sidesteps that issue. But the system we selected, the system I ferreted out with after years of pawing through various companies' schemes, the company has, um, it is all about identity. And it's all about maintaining identity of a product through the flow of the supply chain. Um, the, one of their products, which is not the one we're using because um, it's too intensive, that, they, that the entire U.S. dairy industry uses and half the food audits in the country are done on this platform, um, is a, is a, it's, so it's, it's embedded in the sort of bowels of all these supply chain members because we actually have a really good law called the Food Safety Modernization Act. We don't necessarily comply with the law, <laughs> and we, so we don't enforce it, but we've got a really good law. And so this particular company had figured out a low-cost subscription model that concedes everybody gets to keep their stuff just the way it is, and he has the data dictionary. So mm -hmm. very simple thing. And so in this case, we just pop that out and actually it was a collaboration with the joint artificial intelligence command because they were interested in a supply chain tool and they desperately needed transactional data and one of the places i contribute to government is in in my space the virtually none of the most important data the government needs does the government collect or the government doesn't even know where it is, right? Because it lives in companies. And so for me, there's been a process of surfacing data and I have to go find data in the private sector that's of a quality that's suitable for AI. And in this particular instance, because this company for whatever sets of reasons keeps financial grade data, I was like, okay, I, here's the all the transactional data you asked for. Sort of like, uh oh. <laughs> Here comes so, the avalanche. Head for under the desk, you know, dive for under the desk. But it went over perfectly. There was no problem because the business had actually probably better quality data than many of the attempt, you know, because public collection of data has been challenged in some respects. So this worked magnificently in the middle of the crisis. Shock. Um, but the company is all about that translation. And so we've sidestepped the issue. You go to this Food Source USA site, you just register and a human being calls you back because it's a vetted marketplace. Everyone who registers is in, but you have to be a real person. You have to be able to answer a phone and talk to one of this company's uh, success managers. Hmm. They call you back and then you're in and then you have line of sight in your area, but you can work nationally as well. So it expands its 20 year old technology. I'm told $150 million of investment, it's super robust. And you just walk up in your language and say what you need or what you have. And the system does the rest. Nice. Well, and I like squadron like. of business school students translating the 76 SKUs of a six and a half million dollar inventory, which was our first transaction, not really what one little food pantry needed, into categories. So these translations, we had, just yesterday we got our little squadron of business students who's going to actually do the SKU to product category to, to grind. But once it's done, it's done. It's done and it's reusable. Excellent. And I like what you celebrated about that, Molly, because you pointed out how actually going to industry to get the data was actually a better way to solve the problem. So, it was the so. only way to solve the problem. The only way. And I, you know, I, I, I have not actually done that on that scale before. Um, so crisis prompted a, and, need, and the company had never dealt with the government. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually very helpful because, um, I don't know that it would have gone if there hadn't been a broker. It was, it's just too foreign to regular people. <laughs> you helped serve as a bridge builder. And yeah. That's a good, uh... And personal relationships really matter. You know, one of my, some, one of my former research group members is at the Jake and he helped too. Excellent. So we all just kind of like did our best. <laughs> nice. You know, uh, actually, there. that's a good segue then to Bob, because I know, Bob, you, you build bridges in many different ways. And, and maybe you could, if you could share, um, you know, how do we solve this interoperability problem but still allow communities to have local agency? What would be your thoughts there? So I'll tell you what we are doing. Um, as I mentioned, that the, the, the crisis around COVID and related, you know, 
we're in hurricane season and wildfire season and probably have another surge going on and sometime with COVID and flu season. And so this is a long-term thing. Um, every uh, direct emergency management director I work with have told us this is at least three years out. And so what we're looking at is, all right, now that we know uh, what happened, now we have the lessons learned and we have, we have for the first time, I would say a pull and then that we're not pushing solutions. People are coming and saying, how do we solve it? So, hmm. you know, and, and one of the problems that came up and it came up in all these after action reports is people didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know what data they needed. So how do we do it? Well, it turns out that FEMA did it actually a good thing a few years ago when um, Brock Long was the administrator and he started something called um, uh, a, new net, a new construct around critical community lifelines. And those are the key things that keep society going, essentially. And there are seven of them, health, health and medical is one, safety and security, transportation. And the idea is they've now made this doctrine around all kinds of national policy, around the national um, preparedness um, framework, around um, resilience, national, you know, all of these uh, incident management tools. So for every segment of the emergency management life cycle, from preparedness to planning to prevention to response, recovery, mitigation, ultimately to resilience. So lifelines is now there. So within those lifelines, they have identified made a good start identifying what are the components and subcomponent elements that to help you determine that. And so what we're doing is it, during COVID, no one used this construct. FEMA wanted want people to report around this construct. The construct really wasn't used. I mean, look at the senior leadership briefs, not there. So in a crisis, it wasn't able to be used for a lot of different reasons, but we're going to fix that. And so what we've done is we took, took a situation awareness platform and we're building an architecture and a taxonomy around lifelines that people can then use to plan their incident manage, their uh, incident stabilization planning, their mitigation planning. Here's the data you need. Where is it? Who has it? How do we get it? And through that, we're creating a lifeline partnership working group. So it's a um, you know it's the a coalition of the willing, but we're finding a lot of people willing, and we're looking that to use that as a seed crystal to grow it to come up with a standardized approach that you can get, you can get, uh, uh, find, uh, ingest, organize, manage, use, share the data. Now, within that, we're also building the private sector. When we're in this uh, lifeline partnership working group, it is not just government. Hmm. It's, it's, it's a, new, a new approach to a public-private partnership, and we will also be bringing in NGOs through various other initiatives that we're working with. So we're, we're taking this, we're doing it as a seed crystal to start. We're using an organization, working with an organization called the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium. Do not be fooled by the name. They're an all hazards consortium and they're focused on how to bring technology to help do this, how to build data to do this. I will say, I come back to uh, Krista's uh, digital identity. Identity management is going to be a key component of our enabling us to do this in a way where we have an environment that people can trust. Um, to uh, Derry's point, we are not building something. We are not requiring anybody to use any particular platform. We can make we can make these platforms work together. It's something we've done, so it's a system of systems approach. Um, and you know, we think that um, we're building a system, a network of networks to build, to uh, tap into a system of systems um, to to uh, using national doctrine to do this. So. You know, it's it's beginning to catch on. We've been doing some reviews of it. Uh, we, we need to grow it. Uh, you know, we're a small company and our partners are, you know, have limited dollars, but this is where uh, I think organ, um, um, policy initiatives like the Data Trust, I, I keep coming back to it because as you know, I think it's a great thing, um, come in because one of the things you do find is people don't trust you with their data, right? So you need to build methodologies, you need to build policies, you need to build, you know, the identity management technologies to enable that. So that, that's kind of what we're doing. And as I said, the f first time it's a coalition of the willing. We've been trying to do this. I've been active in data and uh, communications interoperability. It's my whole career is based on that for a, longer than I want to say, because it'll date me. But, <laughs> um, you know, this is the first time we're finding where we, in the past we've done this thing and try to push it down. This is people saying, we need this, help us, how do you do it? So I, I actually have a degree of, uh, for the first time, optimism 
around this. Now, within that, I would like to get that. We're doing it from the middle out. So we're starting at the state level, looking at states as the epicenter, because in fact, they control all the money for the locals that are coming from FEMA. And FEMA has said that the states now have to take over a lot of their responsibilities. So we look at the state at the epicenter and, and, and we'll be building it out. Well said. And, and, and I liked how you talked about how it's, it's, it's the idea that it's people coming to you and it's actually now much more participatory as opposed to being pushed down. Um, one of our geotech commissioners, uh, Sue Gordon, who used to be the principal deputy director of national intelligence, framed our era as possibly one in which things that used to be done by the government can't solely be done by the government. They need industry to be involved, but industry doesn't necessarily know how to make the value proposition beyond uh, creating value for their customers and their shareholders. And then you have a public that doesn't trust either government or industry to do this. And so if that's what we're in, like you said, we've got to figure out new ways of involvement, inclusion, and governance of data uh, to engender trust. Otherwise, we may find that open societies get more and more polarized and fall behind. So I'm now going to switch to a little bit of a lightning round, which means any of you can jump in. Uh, I would just ask, try to keep your answers to maybe two or three tweets. Um, but really what we're looking for here is, let's say I'm either a local mayor or, or someone that's involved with the local government. I want to do what you all are talking about. I want to help make a difference. Uh, what would you recommend they do? How do they get started? So I'll, I'll jump in. So I'm going to, and I'm going to um, build off of what everybody I think has talked about. Um, we, we developed uh, and were involved in developing a model that we call the interoperability continuum some time ago. It's more of a maturity model. How do you do these things? It's a guidance. And so it starts with bringing together a governance. And in this case, I'll bring up the coalition of the willing, even within government, even if you're a mayor. Not everybody, even if you, these, you're the boss of these people, doesn't mean they're going to do it. So find the people who are willing to do it, have them come together. And, and always look to broaden it out as you can, um, build the policies and processes you need and start, right? And start with experiments and, and, and start with pilot. I'm a big believer in experiments and pilot projects because um, success breeds success in this case, but constantly look to expand it, bring in new coalitions of the willing. Well That's said, and I, and, I, and I know Chris and I have talked before about the importance of experiments and, and to point out to people that the word fail is actually an acronym, which means first attempt at iterative learning. Uh, so often we miss that fact that it's iterative learning and we need to go a second and a third and a fourth time to make it better. So well said, Bob. Anyone else uh, want to chime in with a rejoinder? I'll jump in on that one too. The other thing I would encourage people to do is, is not to make it too big to start. Like, be brave, but start small and, and build those wins. Because as David, as you said, it's about trust. And the way you build those, that trust is through those incremental wins. That's where you start to build that belief. Um, the whole Silicon Valley thing of move fast and break things does not work with trust. So go small, find a small thing that you can win at, start to build that coalition of the willing. And as you mentioned, David, all of us have got some kind of government or politics background. And so I'll put a little of that hat on. If you want to protect political capital for people, you build those wins. That is a great way to be able to bring some of those political leaders in is to demonstrate that you have built this community of the willing that is going to back them. And then they don't have to use as much of that political capital to move these initiatives forward. And my experience has been when we were able to prove that, it's amazing how many of those leaders start to come to your movement. But by starting small, it's not with the big flashy ideas that you're able to actually break through. Well said, Krista. Anyone else with a rejoinder? Yeah, I'll join in. Um, with regard to that, I think um, the move fast and, you know, the fail fast still often, you know, the, those topics are unfortunately sometimes used as uh, pieces to beat someone up for trying something new. So I think first, if we can get past the stigma that's associated with it, that's great. I think the other part is the actual engagement inside of the community. Unfortunately, I'm sure where I live, there are probably amazing initiatives that are taking place and they could prop and the challenges that the public or that could help with that are not engaged appropriately because they don't know that they should probably reach out to the public and say, hi, we're trying to solve big problem X. We actually would like some real ideas. No, we're not looking to have pay a billion dollars to, to solve this, but we'd like some ideas and like to listen. And I think having those listening sessions, is one of those actual steps that they should take as one of the first um, pieces is to, to encourage and ask for that help um, because there are plenty of tech out there. Right. 
Plenty of tech, but not enough listeners, not enough people seeking to understand before they seek to be understood. And actually, David, can I just jump in on that real sure. quick? I, I mean, I love what both both Kristen and Derry said because, um, you know, I like to say think big, start small. But um, I, I, but the idea of when you when you're uh, carving out an experiment, do something that's going to engage involve citizens. If you're an, if you're in a, a mayor, or you're a governor, or frankly in the federal government. Um, engage the citizens as part of the solutions. This is not going to be solved um, by government alone. It's not going to be solved by, quote unquote, the private sector as a corporate entity. It's going to be solved by people. And the citizens have to be, as we're seeing now, without that, that trust, you see what's going to happen. You're going to have all kinds of issues. So we need to engage citizens in whatever you do. So whatever experiment, whatever pilot you do, Make sure that that's engaging, not just involving them. It's not just for them, but they are part of your process. I just couldn't. Go ahead, David, can I just hop in? I could not agree more emphatically with what Bob just said. And I want to just add a piece of our experience, which has been very, very powerful for me as I'm listening to the others. Um, we, I emphasize working with teenagers and early 20-somethings. And I am finding that those individuals are so motivated in ways to work and move and, and they are so capable of, thanks to technology, um, I'm just blown away by what they know and what they wanna do. And I just got one of our, one of our I knew one of our group members was getting ready to move on. That's one of the things we do is we're a springboard to lots of different places. I just got a, a resignation letter we were expecting. It made me cry, it was so beautiful. <laughs> and he's on his way to go make a difference. Um, and he's an engineer by training. He is not doing a conventional career. So I think these um, hybrid structures and the kind of commitment that I see in lots of early 20 somethings as a counter to deep anxiety that I also see in lots of 20 somethings. Um, and so I, I just really encourage doing exactly what Bob said with a strong emphasis on ensuring, you know, that to the extent it makes sense, young people are involved, um, not to be ageist, but I just find that um, even the very, even by our standards, the very young um, have such so much to offer. And I teach a class in systems thinking and one of the, presets, or one of my 20-somethings calls them cones, that we teach is, um, is be ex or expect power from where it hasn't come before. Hmm. And we're watching that right now, I think. COVID has forced our hand in some really important ways. And I think we will see power exercise that we are not ready for. And that's often where change occurs. We've got the block and tackle for the usual exercise of power, but it's where power comes in when it hasn't been exercised before. And I think we're likely to see that between uh, the stress and discontent and the capabilities we have. I think it's a very, potentially a very catalytic time. Very catalytic time. And actually that's a good segue to the next question that I'm going to uh, throw upon each of you as a surprise because you were not prepped at all, um, which is, okay, let's do a different perspective. Let's say I, I'm, I'm at a mid to small size business. Maybe I'm the CEO, maybe I'm a COO, but I, I want my company to help seize upon this moment that is trying to recognize that, that, that we do need to have power come from voices that have not historically been heard. We do need to work towards a more just society. And so, so now imagine you're in the lens of the private sector wanting to help create a more just society at the same time, creating a more resilient society rebuilding from COVID-19. So, so what would you recommend to that individual? I'll put my hand up quickly on this one. Um, so I think, I mean, corporations have this incredible resource of human capital. And so much of that has not been directed towards these big challenges. So first I'll give a shout out to an organization called Impact 2030, which is an initiative partnering with the United Nations, 
looking to deploy that human capital as resident within corporations and organizations to really figure out how do we use the skills that we have to take on these big challenges. Not that painting fences isn't hugely valuable and appreciated, but when you have somebody with dairy's capacity to do coding and you can actually start to look at how might we build out some of this infrastructure, we need those that skill being targeted towards these um, these big challenges. So look at look at the skills that you have in the organization and figure out how might we use that to make a difference. And if you're not sure, there is a whole ecosystem. Reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you in with people who are focused exclusively on this, on helping organizations figure out how to solve big problems and how to use that human capital because it is huge. And if we think about how we might deploy that. Um, and what transformation that might create, it's its incredibly exciting. Uh, since you opened up, would you be willing to share a social media handle that someone could reach you at if they had questions, Krista, real quick? Sure. I'm uh, at Krista SP um, on Twitter, so find me there, or just Krista Polly on LinkedIn, and I would be very happy to connect. Excellent. Thank you. Other thoughts from other panelists? I have to jump in here because um, I, in, when I came out of government, I had had enough exposure to the intelligence community to be acquainted with the issue of hard problems and solving hard problems and the performance of diverse teams, the data that show that diverse teams always outperform experts. And so I did an experiment when I came back to Wisconsin. I went to one of our, we have 11 tribes, so I worked with one of the tribes. And I also went to Milwaukee. And as I said, I went to there. Milwaukee, Milwaukee is an uh, American city with many challenges and very significant uh, racial issues. It's sometimes I've heard it said that it's the most segregated city in, in the United States. From a very storied and wonderful city to a, to a city in, in really some grave, facing some grave challenges, we went to the quote, worst high school there was. There were over a thousand students at the time, more like 1,200. And, and with a USDA grant, this was the education piece of it. We simply did exactly what the other panelists have said, and we began to fall into step with the people at the high school. There were these two shop teachers. They had done a workshop. They wanted to do aquaculture. This was preposterous at this high school. Like, the high school, apparently I was on YouTube all over the place for gambling and, you know, God knows, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But we just fell into place with it and uh, strengthened what the teachers were doing very gradually, solved their problems with them and realized, I, when speaking of trust, when we saw the reading scores of the entering ninth grade class, which took four years, I would ask the audience to guess what the median reading level was. And at that point, it became clear that until we address this literacy issue for these incredibly talented human beings who, who are unable to access all of the things we're talking about because of limitations with traditional academic skills, I can't wait to see what it looks like to unlock that talent solving hard problems. So we have, we have developed with the teachers and the students a curriculum that, uh, that addresses that. It's a graduated curriculum that acknowledges the sin of where the reading scores are. It, we are, you know, an entire city is complicit with passing a ninth grade like that. We are all complicit in this and um, and it's intolerable. And so it's been really meaningful to work with students at that age. They are incredible solvers of hard problems. And one, I'll just say one very quick thing too. There have been two things about that that have been incredible. The first was when we got a photograph at the Wisconsin State Fair because the students from Vincent High showed lambs. Hmm. We got our governor from one party a white guy wearing a cowboy hat in a photograph with the superintendent, the CEO of the MPS, the principal, and some of the students. And you know, the first year we tried to get that photo, we couldn't get the people in the frame. We couldn't get the people to stand close enough together to take a photograph. The second year it was like, can we all just get over ourselves and take a photograph? Yep, we could. 
And the other time was when a student who had really struggled, what wouldn't go to class, all this stuff. Well, guess what? The, this amazing animal science teacher got a chinchilla. Hmm. And then she, and then the chinchilla had babies. Oh and those students that were out in the hall causing trouble raced to get to this classroom. And one of them showed me the baby chinchillas and she said, put your hand in here. It feels like a cloud. <laughs> and that's why I keep like this. I have to have hope and I have tremendous hope, even though my work takes me to some very challenged places where inequity and injustice still are just massively central. And yet there is hope for if we if we reach out to each other. I agree. I remember it was a snowy December, I think when we met about 10 years ago in a classified facility and had a fun conversation about hope. So uh, yeah, I can definitely. Uh, yeah, that, that. and that conversation changed my life oh, completely. Wow. Um, Barry, Bob, any other additional thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I think, um, you know, the, the, the part from an engagement perspective, it has to come from a pers what do you want to engage in, right? It, it's that problem of we can't tackle every single problem. And so if a small business, medium sized business, as a CEO, if you want to engage inside of the community and make a difference inside of your community, you have to pick what that difference is going to be. And you can't just pick everything because you're going to solve nothing really fast and get frustrated and, and jump out of it. You have to pick your passion. And this is a statement I give to everyone. If you want to go do something, it doesn't mean that the first thing you do is always the thing that you'll end up doing and, and solving. Um, and not saying that we're going to solve everything, but but be truly engaged. I think the, what needs to happen is you need to start somewhere and, and experiment to determine what is that thing that you can find and provide the most value with. And I think um what what was just said by molly was perfect in that you know you, you came in with one part and then recognize that jumping into another part actually is something that significantly helps the overall anyway and i think that's the that's the challenge for example um when when covid 19 hit and i think the challenge that we can imagine for an educational perspective there are students who and teachers there's not it's not it's not uh, bound by one but students and teachers, not all of them have internet, not all of them have access to computing resources. So it sounds great. And it's unfortunately sometimes somewhat elitist that we collectively forget that if you live in a society in a place where you have access to amazing bandwidth and you have access to computing resources, doing distance learning is a fantastic option for you, right? If you don't have access to those resources, it becomes challenging. So then what do you do? Do you just dial in on the telephone? You know, what, how do you make that? So one of the things that um, I knew where I can make a try to make some difference is um, working and engaging with um, students who we said no questions asked. Just tell us which student doesn't have access to compute resources and we'll provide some. <laughs> right. We're not going to provide the best, but we're going to provide something. And so you start right and you start getting that engagement and through that process you'll figure out what it is that you can do and where the impact is going to be more, most, uh, most felt. So it, it's pick something, start somewhere and, and slowly move into that process. Don't put in, you know, everything all at once. Well said. And I think you, you underscored that, especially what COVID-19 has showed is internet, is internet cannot be seen as a luxury. It really is essential, just like getting uh, running water, or electricity. And if we don't recognize that with communities, we will find people left behind. Um, Bob, I'm going to go to you, but I'm going to actually now shift because we have about uh, six minutes left. And so this is now the final, final lightning round. And this is asking, you know, we've got the G20 coming up soon. Um, world leaders, if you could give them two or three tweets, given everything we've said here, what would you encourage world leaders to do to empower um, everything that we've talked about, making communities more resilient? David, I'm going to sound like an advertisement in order to uh, improve my opportunity to become a fellow. <laughs> but, I think you're in the shoot already. You did a video. Uh, you're great. I am going to say, uh, and I mean it, is, you know, this issue that, that you guys are, have, um, have um, put, to, put out there about creating a data trust, mm -hmm. I would say go create that data trust. Um, I would say bring a governance body together that is broader than government. Um, to do it. 
bring together the, the coalition of the private sector, government, and um, NGOs, and build it. Because as we saw in COVID, and we see it all the time, we saw it during uh, Katrina, which is when I got really into the information sharing and the data side of things, the lack of data, lack of having the right data at the right time, uh, it costs lives. It um, helps destroy, uh, it, it extends suffering as it did in Katrina. And that's the classic example of how I got involved in it when I saw that upfront and uh, personal. And um, it, it um, contributes to deterioration, not building resilience. So, you know, it, it sounds like a trite thing in a sense that it's all about the data, but it is all about the data. And so I would say, you know, bite the bullet, get over yourselves and you know um, build that coalition that can create that data trust and the processes the technology is there i mean everybody here on this phone is set, on this call has said it the technology is not a problem now, i'm not saying that technology is perfect but generally we have what we need what we do not have is that willingness we do not have the governance we do not have the policies so go do it well, well, thank you, Bob. And, and again, recognizing we didn't coordinate on this, we actually do have a paper coming out in about a week or so with the G20 in which we actually emphasize that one thing, which is data trust, and then also thinking about possibly an industry 20 corresponding. Do we need to have a corresponding gathering of global industry analogous to the G20 as well? So, so, so I thank say, you for saying I will that. say to you, David, I would like to talk to you about that because that's been one of my big <laughs> pet passions is bringing industry to that. I think we can do a guest blog together. So I think we've identified our project for you as a fellow. So, so sold. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Molly, two or three tweets that you would recommend to the G20 or other world leaders as we think about this. Uh, food Source USA, right? Dot com. Check out for uh -huh. Food Source USA dot com. You heard it food here now, folks. Food Source USA dot com. And then fuel our food banks because, you believe it or not, there is this incredible network of farm broadcasters and they have set up a similar a, a, a campaign to support this called Fuel Our Food Banks. So those are it. Excellent. Thank and you. And Stock Research Group. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and Derry, yeah. your take. Um, so let's see. Uh, tweets. I, I, I can't. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get it to that small of a, <laughs> a tweet that Molly just put out there. <laughs> but oh, uh, you do the extended tweet. <laughs> but I'll just slightly extend it. I think um, piggybacking off of uh, what was said with regard to um, your upcoming paper and, and Bob's uh, passion here, um, I think it's the have the G20 empowering the locals to make things happen and encouraging it. It's there's one thing to say that we can put um, the, the, if you will, the lipstick on the pig, but it's actually telling and working and saying, hey, I, I would like my folks to do this and going out and being public about it and the involvement of NGOs because the lack of trust in corporations is there. So it has to be a combination of NGOs, corporations and government because if we I think if you, you told everyone to just put a massive corporation involved, they distrust it just as much as government. Um, so, so get involved by actually empowering people to do it and, and putting some, some measurable items on your agenda to say, this is how we're going to involve and get people to, to be better, to build those resilient communities. Well said, empower the edge. Thank you, Derry. And, and Krista, you get the closing last words. All right, so I guess mine would be, uh, and you said it earlier, be catalytic. Uh, I will say our framework in Canada was actually born out of a model called catalytic governance. And if you haven't read up on that, please do go check it out, catalyticgovernance.com. Um, don't be constrained by the way things have always been done. This is our opportunity to imagine differently. So let's be bold and break those models. And in so doing, let's seek out uncommon partners and bring them to the table. Because in so doing, we're going to create something new, something different, and hopefully catalyze something really exciting. And through that, building trust. And to me, that's been the core of this whole conversation is it is so deeply founded on trust. So all the data is about trust, all of the interoperability, the governance, it's, it's that focus. So that would be my call. 
Thank you. Very well said. I look, and again, thank you all for all the positive change that you all do as catalytic change agents. Um, I look forward to having you back on when Bob's also a senior fellow. We'll have to have him back so we can have you all be senior fellows, which will happen soon. Um, but most importantly, thank you for your wealth of insights on empowering the local edge. Thank you for everything you're doing. And uh, I, you have given, I think, both me and everyone watching this hope amidst everything else that's happening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.